Friends, if you did not know yet, Reverend Hope was just ordained about a week and a half ago at the Minnesota Annual Conference on May 24th, and we are so excited for, for this momentous occasion for you. And we have a gift for you. So this is your ordination stole. So uh, when, when someone's ordained, we give them a red Pentecost stole because they're ordained in the season of Pentecost. So yours is red with some gold. Mine's also red. We were made by uh, Reverend Pam Sardar. So one of our former clergy persons are one of the people, uh, along with a few other clergy who helped to craft these. And then we also got you this wonderful, you can pull it out for if you want. We got you this great green stole. So you have something for the fall season, and we knew we'd li- you'd like it because you picked it. <laughs> and I got one for you, too. Long, long ago, I asked Reverend Pam, hey, would you make Hope and I some matching Advent stoles? So I think, oh, this one. So, we have some ash- so now we have something blue for Christmas time. So let's hear it for Reverend Hope. That's a great way to start worship, isn't it? Let's ordain somebody every week. Why not? Good morning, church. I'm Reverend Nate Melcher. Welcome to worship as Richfield United Methodist Church in Minneapolis. Your church acknowledges that we gather on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. The best of all is, God is with us. Let's say that all together. The best of all is, God is with us. Welcome to you who are worshiping here in the sanctuary, live online, by the phone, and in the worship archives. We're glad you're here. If you would uh, sign in and let us know you're here, we'd appreciate it. And if you're new here, welcome. We hope you have a good experience. Today we're going to celebrate the Sacrament of Holy Communion, and you're invited to gather the elements with care and delight. We also have single-serve elements in the sanctuary, including a gluten-free option. There is a church conference immediately after worship right here in the sanctuary. It's for the purpose of electing new leaders. It will be a brief church conference. We ask you to stick around in just a few moments. And that church conference is also available by Zoom. Those details are in the bulletin for our online worshipers today. Right after that, we will have a reception to celebrate Reverend Hope's ordination. So stick around for cookies. Now, the cookies are not available by Zoom. It's just, just here. They're working on the technology someday, maybe. So I hope to see you as we celebrate Reverend Hope. She was ordained along with Pastor Lee Miller, and other folks were commissioned and made local licensed pastors, and a whole lot of other great things happened at the annual conference session. And we have a brief video clip that was provided by the conference to kind of show you an overview of what happened there. So let's take a look. It is my joy, my privilege, my pleasure as your bishop to welcome you to the 168th session of the Minnesota Annual Conference. I always say I'm trying to keep up with the spirit, but sometimes keeping up with the spirit means slowing down. This cause reckless angels and ancestors is God and protect us. Love and hate flesh on the brass nickels. We down with the raw, raw ruckus. Suck his butts. My heart is got in my The items 101, 102, and 103 that we'll be considering. God has been faithful, and you, the people of God, have stepped out in faith. Thanks be to God. Will the teller please take out that envelope and open it up and hand a ballot to everyone at your table who is eligible to vote? Item 150 was approved by a vote of 339 to 36. Whoa, you got nothing to hear, you know what I hear? Quite 
the church is to be the church, to convince the world of the reality of the gospel, to witness that God is still at work in the world, to serve this world with kindness and toward justice, the church needs leaders. Friends, you've answered the call. Next year's conference preacher is Becky Jo Messenbrink. Perhaps as a conference our way into the future is to follow Jesus on a journey where our souls are made large, our hearts capacious, our minds expansive, when we can hold creatively together spaciousness and direction, clarity and complexity and humility, where cure is care and being steeped in the love of God as we know it in Jesus, the grace of God, God's dream and desire for the world is what it's about. It was a wonderful time. Uh, I can say, for, for me, those are a lot of hundreds of clergy colleagues I've not seen in person in years. And so it was just wonderful to be together in the same room once again. And we can give you a very brief update about annual conference, legislation, etc., at that church conference meeting today after worship. So today we begin our summer of music presented by our Growth Scholarship recipients. Each year, your church gives out thousands of dollars in scholarships to young people pursuing the creative arts, and we are delighted to have them share their gifts in worship all summer long. So will you please welcome today's Growth Scholar vocalist Sarah Schiff and her accompanist Wen Shui Zhang. Can you stand up here? Oh, it's just to stand up and be recognized. Oh, not, 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 not now, Wen Shui. I was just waiting for you to stand up. You're not going to play yet. Sorry. My fault. I didn't tell you I was going to do that. So, uh, Okay, so all of that's today, right? So what happens next week? Next week, worship is at the Richfield Bandshell off of 66th Street, okay? Why am I pointing that way? It's this way. It's off 66th Street. So the Richfield Bandshell, bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket, bring your bike. We're going to have a blessing of the bicycles. And also, uh, we're going to be honoring our graduates that day as well. Now, there's no bus service for next Sunday at the band shell or any of the band shell worships. And this worship service, it will not be recorded. So it's in person only. There will be a worship rebroadcast online and by phone at our usual time. So either way, there will be worship. I hope to see you next week, but not in the building, okay? And today, please take a moment to review your bulletin. There's so much news. There's so many announcements about Vacation Bible School starting next Sunday. If you want to be a servant volunteer, talk to Reverend Hope. The upcoming Pride Festival in the March. The Wednesday Bible Study. Field trip to the St. John's Illuminated Bible Museum this Wednesday. Talk to me if you want to go. And uh, the great giveaway is this Saturday. And our ongoing 30 days of prayer for Caring for Children Child Care Center right downstairs for the families and staff as we seek more staff to bolster our roster as we move forward. The Spirit is moving in so many ways in this church. Can you feel it? Amen. Friends, today we're gathered in the Holy Spirit to partner with Jesus and praise our living God. Welcome to worship. Would you all please rise in body or spirit and join me in the call to worship. Holy One calls our children to prophecy. We come ready to hear the word of God. Holy One calls our young people to see visions. We come ready to see new visions. Holy One calls our elders to dream dreams. We come ready to dream new dreams. The spirit of the Holy One is poured upon all flesh. We come ready to be filled with God's spirit. Please remain standing in body or spirit to sing uh, the, our opening hymn, and please remember to wear a mask while you are singing. Thank you. <coughs>
be seated and join me in this prayer of confession. Spirit of truth, giver of visions, sender of dreams, our hearts remained troubled and afraid. Where we fear the future, forgetting your promise to do whatever we ask in your name. Your promise to fill us with new vision, to give us gifts of prophecy and dreams. Yet we act as if we are our own, forgetting your promise to fill us with your spirit. You tell us that we are not alone, that you are always with us. Forgive us when we forget and we fail to keep your commandments to you, love you and one another. Hear us now in our silent confessions to you. And now hear these words. The God who created you knows your heart and loves you. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. So now it's time for time with children. So will the children please come forward? And we're going we're gonna to be over here for a minute instead of on the steps today. Yeah, you guys ready? All right. So today in church, we are talking about all of the weird things that we do in church. Do we do some weird things? Yeah. Have we done some weird things already today? Yeah, it's really, it was really weird when we put this on me in the middle of worship, isn't it? Is that weird? Yeah. yeah. And why is mine different than Pastor Nate's? Do you know that? Yeah. You know? Really? Yeah. I would, I actually, I'd be very impressed if you knew that information. A lot of people don't know that information. <laughs> so we're going to talk about it real quick. So this stole goes across my body because I am a deacon. Deacons are uh, one of the, the really special things is that the, the thing that we're called to most is to serve others and to help lead others to serve the world. And Jesus did that. So Jesus, yeah. And I know it now means that you're a pastor. This well, also means that. Yeah, it means, yeah. That, we're, yeah. means that we're both clergy, yeah. but just in different ways. Mm -hmm. So while Reverend Hope is called yeah. as a deacon to uh, connect the church with the world, mine is over like this, and it's kind of supposed to be like a yoke, not like an egg yolk, but like the yolk that ox take. You know when yeah. ox pull a cart, like pull it like this? Or when right? horses pull a cart, too. Yeah. 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 So, so it's like taking on Jesus' yoke so that we can lead the church. So one of the things mm -hmm. I'm called to do is to help lead churches. Yep. And what I'm called to do is there's this really cool story um, in, in, during Holy Week where Jesus sits down and he washes the feet of his disciples. Does that sound kind of weird? Yeah. That sounds super weird. That's not a thing that, that leaders normally do. But Jesus was a special kind of leader who believed that it's important to serve others while leading. Yeah. And so when he did that, Jesus put a towel across his body so that when he washed the feet, he could dry them. So deacons, we wear a stole across, just like Jesus' towel to remind us that we are called to serve and to lead others to serve. Yeah. You want to try one on? Try, yeah, you want to try it on? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I think these can be a little long a for A little you. long, yeah. So why don't you stand in front of me and face no, the people you cannot, here? No, you cannot keep it. So now the stole is technically yeah. the, it's the mark of ordination. So you shouldn't wear these until you're ordained. However, I think yeah. for today's purposes, this you two look good. A, yeah. You look so, awesome. So if you want to talk about seminary scholarships, uh, we can make that happen, we right? We can. There are How lots of it? them available. Yeah, you look good. All right. <laughs> Should we be in prayer? Yeah. Let's Gracious see. and loving God, we are grateful for your church, in which you use to lead your love into the world. And we thank you for leaders, including leaders like these young children, who are blessed to remind us of the ways in which you operate in this world. Lead us into your love so that we can share it and grow in it. Bless these children. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to help us share the peace? Yeah. All right, so here what we'll do on the count of one, two, three, we'll say, May the peace of God be with you. you ready? One, one two, two, three. three. May, May the, the peace of God be with you. And also with you. Please share signs of peace. Yeah. 
as a church, we share the peace. And as a church, we thank God that God shares love with us all the time. And so if you felt yourself especially close to God this week, I invite you to come forward and to light a candle to celebrate that conflux moment where your life's journey met God's heart. Together, let us celebrate the light of the world. Thank you so much. Friends, I encourage you to uh, extend a hand, a hand toward the lit candles. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we are so blessed to feel your love. Uh, help us to continue to feel it and share it. For your world has brokenness and it needs your healing. Bless all people in need of your healing. Amen. It's Pentecost Sunday, and we return to this story from early in the Acts of the Apostles, as we do around this time every year, and we witness the early birthing of the church as God gathers people from all corners of the world, and yes, we're going to hear about all of them. We're not going to skip all the different places where they're from. Hey, you want people to remember you and your friends, we'll remember them, right? And uh, as you listen, yes, it is okay to chuckle halfway through when someone accuses the disciples of drinking. It's okay to laugh at that. And yes, that warm feeling you get as you experience their devotion after such an amazing moment, that warm feeling you get, that's real. And you should listen to that for your own life as well. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 verses 1 through 16 and 37 to 47. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like a rush of violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one had heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, 
they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds and power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today we begin a summer slate of sermons that we're once again calling So Many Questions. It's based on your submitted questions from the spring about God, faith, the Bible, church, and life. And we love getting your questions because it's a window into what you're wondering about theologically. <clears throat> and uh, friends, church, you're a deep church. You ask really good questions. And each time you write a question for this series, you are giving your church a gift you are telling the other people here and the people who are yet to come, hey, questions are welcome here. It's okay to wonder. It's okay to not have all the answers. That goes for me as well. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting theologian Brian McLaren, and he gave a lecture, and at the conclusion, he opened the floor for Q&R. And we might be used to Q&A, right? Q&A stands for questions and answers. But he said, I do Q&R. I do questions and responses because who am I to have all the answers? And I kind of like that. And that's how I feel about these sermons. They're responses to your questions. Now, I know some people wish their pastor had all the answers. And for what it's worth, so do I. If I had all the answers, I would not have spent two hours putting together an Adirondack chair yesterday. Backwards twice. Now that I've gained your confidence, our first question this year is a fun one. Why is the church so weird? 
Now, I admit, this is not how the question was worded when it was asked, but really, this is an amalgamation of many questions we have about why we do certain rituals, why we do things the way we do things, why we believe what we believe, why we practice what we, what we practice, why the clergy wear what they wear. Like, why do we wear robes? Robes are pretty anachronistic in modern society, don't you think? So why do we wear these ancient robes in modern times? Well, we don't always wear robes. Sometimes it's a suit or a dress or a shirt and tie and sweater. I preach my fair share of sermons in a clergy collar shirt and jeans. The special word for what we wear is called vestments. And we put on our vestments, be it a, a robe and stole, or maybe a pectoral cross, that clergy ca- tab collar, or simply just putting on our outfit for the day. And when we put on these vestments, we put on the role of clergy. And it's to be fully present to the life of the church. So we set aside all that other stuff we've got going on in our lives, the challenges, the grief, and so on, so we can put on the role, step into the office or role to be fully present. But maybe while we do that kind of officially with these robes and whatnot, don't we all do that sort of prep when we get our hearts and minds ready for worship? You get ready to come to campus and you think about how you're going to be present to your friends, how you're going to be present to new people who want to see if this is the right church for them, how you're going to be present to the God who is present to you, the God whom we gather to worship. Now, I'm wearing my black pe- preaching robe today, but sometimes I wear my white robe, which is called an alb, A-L-B, alb, or alb, 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 I'm going to go with alb. Now, the funny thing is about an alb, anybody can wear that. Did you know that? Anybody is allowed to wear an alb. It's not just clergy. See, alb comes from the Latin albus, which means white, which is a color often associated with baptism. And an alb is simply a basic baptismal garment. It's not just for pastors. It's for ministers. Now, who are the ministers? You're the ministers. Did you know you're a minister? Absolutely you are. Now, we're all within what's called the priesthood of believers. We all do the ministry of the church. Thus, we are ministers. That's why the bulletin may list Reverend Hope and I as the appointed clergy team, and yet it says ministers, all members of the congregation. And that's you. And as I say, if you want to wear an alb to worship, nothing's stopping you. So the stole is the mark of ordination, but not the alb. So you should try one on. In fact, let's try one on today. Uh, let's see. I, ha- I happen to have my alb here. Hey, David. David, would you want to try on my alb? All right. I think you're going to get in this. Now, this is, I can't remember what it's made of, but it's really cozy. So let's see. Put that on there. And we'll turn you around. Got your arm in there. And it's got uh, secret Velcro paneling. That's right. I use a lot of Velcro. And it'll zip you up. Isn't that comfy? That it is. And it's kind of cool, too. So kind of moisture wicking, I guess. And I used to give the prayers at uh, community meetings. I always thought I should have been a minister. Well, you could. You could. That Look at that. That looks good. I like it. <laughs> so you can, you can feel free to keep that on the rest of the service or take it off, whatever you do. So. Okay, why don't I just leave it on? All right, have a seat and leave it on. Go for it. That's an alb. Alb. Not a robe, an alb. We've got like a special word for everything, don't we? So it's not just a robe, it's an alb. Uh, we don't have a lobby. We walk into the what? Anybody know? The narthex. Can't call it a lobby, you gotta call it a narthex. You don't store stuff in the storage room, you store stuff in the sacristy. I'm not at the lectern on the stage in front of the audience in the arena. I'm at the pulpit on the chancel in front of the worshiping body in the nave of the sanctuary. We don't throw a big birthday party with singing and candles and gifts. It's not a birthday party, it's called Christmas Eve worship. So see, a special word for everything. Now, it's funny, we have not always worn alts or stoles. 
There is a record of vestments beginning in the earliest centuries of the church. Yet in the Methodist movement, at least, robes and stoles weren't all that common until the post-World War II era. You get to the 1940s, 1950s, suddenly stoles, robes, vestments become popular in many churches in the United States. Think of it this way. Do you really think that all of John Wesley's circuit rider preachers in the 1700s and 1800s were gallivanting across the prairie on horseback wearing an olive and a stole? Probably not. That's one of the weirdest things about the church these days. Sometimes we catch ourselves thinking, but that's the way we've always done it. Even when it isn't. Even when we don't know why we do it, we might still do it. You may have heard a story like this before. A newlywed is looking to impress their new partner, so they set out to prepare an impressive baked ham dinner, just like their parent made and like their grandparent made. So their partner is watching them prepare this ham dinner, and they see them carefully slice about an inch off of either end of the ham. And the partner asks, why do you cut the ends off the ham? Well, that's the way my parent did it. Oh, okay. Why did your parent cut off the ends of the ham? I don't know. So they call their parent and they say, hey, why did you cut the ends off the ham? Well, that's the way that my parent did it. Well, why did they cut the ends off the ham? I don't know. So they call the grandparent. Why did you cut the ends off the ham? Oh, that's easy. I always did that so the ham would fit in the baking pan. The weird thing about the church is that much of these things go back even further than we think they do, but also they don't all go back to the exact same origin point. Clergy vestments may go back to the first few centuries of the Christian church, but stained glass in cathedrals, that didn't really catch on until about the 12th century CE. Stained glass has been around for thousands of years in many cultures, but that was that turning point, Europe, 12th century CE. But it didn't get everywhere. Big in Europe, came, became big in the U.S., but stained glass is not a requirement of the church checklist, which begs the question, is there a church checklist? Is there one way the church is exactly, specifically, absolutely supposed to do this, say this, look like this, believe this? One of the weird things about church is any church you go to feels familiar and foreign all at once. Flavors flickering like candle flames depending on that church's local culture. Because churches essentially do things similar yet distinct, it's kind of weird. We amalgamate a choir and an organ and a band. Maybe they just do piano or band or a cappella. We have a child care center. They have a food pantry. We worship Sunday mornings. They worship Friday nights. One of the most challenging aspects of the church is there is one church, capital C, one church. There is one Christ, Jesus, the one who saves, one Christ. Yet there's many interpretations of that Christ and many ways of embodying that church. Even within any given church, including this one, not every single person believes everything exactly the same way. And why? It's that Pentecost story from the Acts of the Apostles. The crowds of disciples came from everywhere, all four corners of the earth, and they felt the presence of the Holy Spirit as a group, as a church. They felt that presence, and then they took that felt presence experience, and they took it back to where they came from, and they shared it with their people. And despite hundreds of years worth of attempted codification, canonization, creed crafting councils, doctrinal development, and good old-fashioned rules, despite all of that, we still all kind of do it our own way. And it's the best we can. And that's kind of weird. Sometimes we catch ourselves thinking, but that's the way we've always done it. Sometimes we catch ourselves thinking that relative line, but we've never done it that way before. Even if we have done it that way before, by the way. 
I, I remember working at a movie theater in high school back in Pipestone. And when I was in high school, the movie started at 7 o'clock. The owner wanted it to start at 7 so we could get home earlier. But when I was in elementary school, it started at 7.30. So sometime between elementary school and high school, like middle school, turned to 7 o'clock. When I was working the box office, people would still come in at 7.30 to go to the movie at 7.30. And I'd say, well, sorry, it's, it's actually at 7. But it's always been at 7.30. Well, it was, but it isn't anymore. My newspaper said 7.30. I'm sure it did. I propose that when it comes to describing the church, we avoid that's the way we've always done it because that's never true. And that we avoid but we've never done it that way before because that's not always true. And how does one define oneself by a negative? So tell me about yourself. Well, I don't do that thing over there. Can you hear how saying what you are not does not say a single thing about who you are? I know that we live in a world where it's fashionable to critique institutions, to draw a line between us and them, to point out who's wrong and thus who's right. But that's a pretty weird way to get people interested in what you're passionate about, including the church. When I first started as a youth director years ago, my friends in the secular world who were usually atheist or agnostic as I had been, they would ask, what am I doing for work these days? No, I'd, I'd say, oh, I'm at one of those non-judgmental, non-hateful churches. Can you hear the irony in there? I'm at one of those non-judgmental churches. That's a pretty judgy statement, Pastor Nate. You know, they're so judgy over there, I'm not like them. And I got to tell you, I regret talking about my church that way. It didn't do them any good. It did them a disservice to talk about them. It, it, rather, it did a disservice to not talk about why they're good people, why they do good work when people ask about it. And it didn't help me practice talking about who they were or who I am and who I'd become as a person of faith. Are we as churches done defining ourselves by what we are not? Done saying, we're not a judgy church. Or, we're not that church on the street corner with the guy with the bullhorn. Or, well, we're not that church who's trying to, you know, whitewash the realities of U.S. history or, or take away a woman's right to her own body autonomy. Or, or that church trying to impose belief systems on everybody. Or, or that church who says, well, oh, the Bible can only be read one way. We're, we're not that church. Could be another way. Maybe with lament. Well, yeah, we're a church, but we're not as relevant as we used to be. We're, we're not as big as we were in 1955. We're not sure what the next big ministry will be. Well, we don't really know how to talk to our children and grandchildren about faith. Well, we're not really sure about the future. Ah, okay. Then what are you like? Um, can you hear the difference? Let's not get stuck in the we're not that kind of church spiral. What if we define ourselves by what we are? Would it be too weird to tell others we're a church who believes that God loves you? We're a church who believes God loves everybody. We're a church who believes all means all. We're a church who believes justice will prevail and true, true strength lies in mercy. We're a church who believes death and violence will never have the last word. We're a church who believes in lifting up marginalized voices. We're a church who believes in many kinds of people being in leadership. We're the kind of church who believes in living out the Pentecost story. For we are a church, if we take that last paragraph from that Pentecost reading and put it into our context, we're a church who devotes ourselves to faithful teaching, strong fellowship, breaking bread together, and praying together. We're a church who values awe, who seeks out wonders and signs and conflux moments. We are a church who comes together to be present with all things in common through our commitments of prayer, presence, gifts, service, and witness as members. We are a church who day by day spends time together, shares together, fills one another's glad and generous hearts, a church who praises God, a church who strives to have goodwill for all people. Last year, 
Gallup released a new report that shows for the first time since they started tracking in the early 20th century that less than half of U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. For the first time in about 100 years, it's now less than half. Church is officially no longer the majority in the United States. It's not the norm, and guess what that means? Church is weird. It's officially weird to believe that God loves you. Now we can run from that, or we can embrace it. We can put away the robes and candles and narthexes, or we can affirm this is who we are. The spirit present in that upper room in Acts is present today. Going forth in love and sharing then, that's carried forth in our lives now. The drive to commit ourselves to the teachings of Jesus is weird, and thank God for it. May you put on the role of minister, the role of the church. May you listen to the Holy Spirit. May she dance all over you like wind and tongues of fire. And listen and know that you are loved as a church, as a person, as beloved of God, even if it makes you a little weird. May it be so, and amen. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up, up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give, give our, our thanks, thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the face of the waters. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Your spirit came upon prophets and teachers, anointing them to speak your word. And so, with your people on earth and the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. At his baptism in the Jordan, your spirit descended upon him and declared him your beloved son. With your spirit upon him, he turned away from the temptation of sin. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, ate with sinners. By the baptism of his life, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, baptizing us with the Holy Spirit and with fire, as so on the day of Pentecost. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks to you, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant 
poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and the vine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen in the United Methodist Church, we practice open communion. That is to say, we place no barrier between you and the Lord's table. All who are seeking the grace of Jesus are welcome. We'll ask you to approach by the center aisle, and you will receive one of the single serve cups if you've not brought your own elements. You will return by the side aisles. Uh, sometimes I know these can be a little tricky, and so if you'd like to have a hand tissue in case you have any spill, there is a box of tissues on either side as you go back to your seats. Also, I want to say that in the midst of communion, it's also a time when we remember that we give back to the abundance of God with our offerings and tithes, and we're committing ourselves to the mission of the church to help people live in faith, justice, and joy. Today, we also give back to God with the celebration of Peace with Justice Sunday. Today uh, is one of the six special giving Sundays in the United Methodist Church, and we know that political and social turmoil can be caused by a number of issues economic disparity, environmental degradation, gender inequality, racism, xenophobia, illness, and disease. And if we want peace, we must be committed to disrupting these conditions and systems that perpetuate injustice. So we have two things that you can do today. One of them is giving to the Peace with Justice Sunday offering, and another is a letter writing campaign. Some of you may recall that in our Lenten devotionals the last few years, we've had prayers from Bread for the World. Bread for the World is an organization that uh, works hard at ca the Capitol Hill level to uh, build more just and sustained systems regarding hunger and ending childhood poverty. And as a justice-oriented church, we advocate for better policies and actions that bring change. And so this is right up our alley, friends. We have template letters from Bread for the World to encourage our representatives and senators to expand free school meals and expand the child tax credit to help eliminate hunger and help eliminate childhood poverty in our nation. So we have letters and information from Bread for the World here. They're in the Commons, so after the church conference, we encourage you to write a letter. We have stamps and envelopes. We can get it out for you. Uh, make, write a letter or make a call. It's better than an email. They read these letters. When you take the time to write it, it means more to them. And as we break bread at this table, may we remember that God's love expands to all tables. And we have a role in making sure that no child's table is empty. On Peace with Justice Sunday, we partner with other United Methodist congregations in a special offering to support advocacy around the world. And together we strengthen God's creation with ministries that challenge those structures of inequality. So for example, last year, we as a worldwide United Methodist Church, we gave $328,463 together 
through the Peace with Justice special offering. Now, half the funds go to grants that go to local churches, districts, conferences, and other affiliated organizations all over the world who are doing peace and justice advocacy work. And then the other 50%, that remains right here in the Minnesota Annual Conference for the peace and justice advocacy work that we do in the great state of Minnesota. Now you can give to this special offering in person or online and give throughout the week to this critical cause. Thank you for your extravagant generosity. Friends, the table is set. All are invited. Let us remember Christ our Lord. pray together. Holy One, in mystery, make your love clear so that we feel it, believe in it, and share it. Bless our lifelong journey with you, and hear us now in our breakthrough prayer. Loving God of all, renew our hearts and minds. Reveal your wildest dreams. Break through to each of us. Unite us in your vision. Equip us for your work. Transform us by your song create our harmony. May we embrace your future and be your loving church. Amen.
Thanks again to our Growth Scholar, Sarah Schiff. Thank you for your gift of song. And everybody, we will be starting the church conference as soon as we get the online parts uh, all set up. So if you're worshiping online and would like to join for that church conference, the login details are in the bulletin. We'll get you in there soon. And then there's cookies afterward. That's right, cookies to celebrate Reverend Hope's ordination. You got to go to the church conference before you get a cookie, all right? So... But all that said, go with God. Go with God who is the creator of something new in you every day. Go with Jesus who is at the heart of reconciliation. And go with the Holy Spirit who is like the wind bringing tongues of fire then, now, and forever. Amen.